Hey, I'm Scott. And I'm Chris. And this is Doxologic, where we help you think with your Bible. Well, welcome back, everyone, for another exciting episode of Doxologic here, as always, with Scott. What's going on, man? It's going well, Christopher. It's good to be back. I got to use your full name just there. Um, yes, indeed. You used to be called CJ in seventh grade. <laughs> I'm just saying. You just found that out five minutes there, ago. I, I just felt like the people today needed to know that, and it's a great start. Um, yeah, that, that lasted three weeks, and I put it into it, yes. so it's not starting right, again. So just Christopher today. It's no great to be CJ with you. CJ here. Yeah, man. Uh, it's hard to believe. Uh, summer feels like it's just almost winding down. It's the beginning of August. Wow. It's been a little while since we've been you know, in studio here. Here we got a topic that is near to our heart, uh, just from both of our personal histories, even long before we knew one another. Uh, and I'm talking about Mars Hill Church and the um, the podcast that's come out, the rise and the fall of Mars Hill Church that Christianity Today has produced, has uh, really gotten a ton of notoriety. We've both been listening to it, and you shared it with me um, several weeks back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, they were starting to do kind of previews and, and gave a little trailer, so to speak, um, in, uh, I think it was May, about what was coming, and I was like, oh, I got to get on this for so many reasons we'll explain to you today. But uh, I just looked as of late... This podcast, not just in Christian podcasts, but in all of podcasts, is in the top 20? Seriously. I mean, it is up there. Yeah. Yeah, So there's a lot of listeners. So it's got, yeah, tons of listenership and everything, and we've got a lot of personal experience with this. I'll just go first. I'm thinking about 2006. I graduated college, became a youth pastor right out of college for four years, and I did not grow up in kind of a Reformed church or much of a kind of a um, uh, theologically-minded church, really, uh, in my early years, and then even through college, and I just got just um, blown blown up in the best way by Mark Driscoll and his preaching style, and that was the same time John Piper. He'd been around a long time, but I just didn't know much of him. Matt Chandler, other guys, just my wife and I were absorbing this stuff uh, for years on a weekly basis, and um, think about going to their Resurgence Conference in 2008 with a pastor friend of mine that I was working with and his family, and uh, just a uh, a really uh, profoundly formative time that Mark Driscoll and the resurgence and, you know, just the name Mars Hill Church. I mean, you didn't, you, almost no one um, in my circle at the time, several years went by, uh, that didn't know who he was. And everyone had an opinion and some very strong opinions on both sides. Um, and so it's just wild to think about now, a long time after the church is gone, and you can go into some of that history, uh, how we're back here in our you know mid to late 30s here talking about something, and, and many people talking about something that really profoundly impacted their mm. theological journey, yeah. their time in the church. Yeah, so I want to say Mars Hill started in 1996, I believe, yeah, I believe so. and then shut down in 2014. And I, like you, you actually put a um, word to it earlier, theological orphan was kind of that way. First of all, grew up not really going to church. And then finally, once I got to church, didn't know what kind of church I was in, didn't even know there were types of churches. Sure. And so listening to uh, Mark Driscoll for the first time was a was an eye-opener. Uh, it was the first time I had ever heard verse by verse verse Bible preaching. And as such, it was the first time I ever really understood what the Bible was saying in context. And it was incredibly powerful. I mean, it was reshaping my life. The way I would describe my Christianity at that point was like a floating theological orbit of cliche verses totally disconnected from each other, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, dot, 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 on the soccer field. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? And and had no idea where that was in the context of the book of John, for example. But Driscoll was almost doing something where was like, can he do that? As he just preached verse by verse so powerfully through the Bible, I would say it was really listening to Driscoll, which, you know, to even get connected to Driscoll, it was passed on to me by a friend at Campus Crusade for Christ mm. my freshman year at UCLA. Okay. So it was radically uh, life altering in some ways because of what it, 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 it invited me into. It reframed for me the biblical role of pastor, which I now serve in, by giving me kind of a 
distinctive difference between sort of the mainstream kind of, um, you know, uh, stand-up comedian, uh, leadership guru, and, and, and the Bible's picture is so much different, you know, with just the solidness of the preaching, um, the commitment to being a shepherd, all these different things that were drawn out of the Word. It instilled in me, uh, through Driscoll's ministry, a passion for church planning, opened up to me, this is probably the biggest thing, like you said, it opened up to me that Christianity had a past hmm. and not just a present. Right. Yeah. And I don't know if I understood that, that whatever I was I- enjoying now as church, quote unquote church, has come out of a history of the church and, and its various movements up through the last, you know, 2000 years or whatever. And so what it did was kind of Driscoll was the gateway to opening me up to so much rich historical um, benefit, the reformers, the Puritans, you know, um, early church fathers, it just kind of opened that door that I didn't even know existed. And so, um, yeah, a lot there. It was kind of the, the gateway to many, many great things. Yeah, yeah. And so there, there, there was and is even still a whole lot to appreciate from the ministry there, but man, did it end quickly when it ended. Yeah. Um, from the inside, I think we, we know a bit more as this podcast has unveiled that it wasn't so much uh, that nothing was going on controversially and then all of a sudden, but sure. to the outside, because they were up in Seattle, Washington, which was part of the remarkable nature of what he was preaching, how he was preaching, the size and influence of the church in an area that was just um, spectacularly unreached by USA standards, right? I mean, it was one of the most unreached and unchurched areas in the entire country. And so um, the fascination with that um, became part of the fascination with how it ended in 2014 with Driscoll getting uh, put pushed out slash he chose to leave as uh, yeah. he says that's uh, interesting got released yeah. by God heard from the Lord that he was released he and his wife uh, named Grace uh, were released from Mars Hill in the midst of this controversy yeah. that rather than stay put rather than go through either what you might call a church discipline or church restoration process they decided through what they believe and still dogmatically assert today was the Lord releasing them right. that they uh, they took off basically right. And the church imploded because of that. And within months, the six or seven campuses became uh, disparate churches, totally uh, separate churches. And all of a sudden, it was just like, poof, it's gone. It was a shocking day uh, for evangelicalism in general, but I think for just the Christian population at large to see something so massive go down like that. And I actually think at that point, Six or seven is actually quite low for the amount of campuses. I want to say they were at 15 campuses in well, they were five mul- states. Multiple and states. So we're I, talking about, yeah, I was forgetting about that. this broadening expansion with the uh, use of this technology of multi-site, right? They were getting all over the place. And so to see something that large... Mm-hmm come apart so quickly was um, was shocking. And, and to be honest, and we'll get to this, because you did say something about the God told me thing, and we're going to speak into that a little bit. But yes, Mark City got released by God from Mars Hill. That was his justification for leaving. And just to give an update, fast forward, he probably was out for, I want to say, maybe a year or maybe so. A year. Yeah. And now he is a pastor again, uh, I guess self-appointed, uh, of Trinity Church in Scottsdale, Arizona. And sadly, some of the same allegations that were made at Mars Hill are coming out, and also maybe some worse ones as well. We'll probably get into that a little bit. Right. So, you know, his the allegations um, broadly were, were about just a, an, an abusive a form of spiritual leadership, a domineering style, and things that he said in, in public were one thing, and, and yet what's come out in pr- that was in private was equally, if not more so, disturbing as we look back to it. But, but why are we talking about this today? Uh, let's bring our listeners in, if they don't already know, the podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill Church by Christianity Today is now... Seven years later, taking a look back at kind of the question from the first episode of like who killed Mars Hill. Um, and it's looking back at what happened. It's, it, it's covering different themes. They've got five. Um, for as popular as it is, it's only five uh, episodes so far. And, and they've got a well-produced, uh, impressive in that way. Um, yeah, it's really enjoyable. Pr- to yeah, to. A quality product that's going on. I've appreciated you know that side of it for sure. It's uh, something to aspire to in a way of just their, their narration, the storytelling, the interviews, all that. Um, asking a lot of questions from people on the inside 
inside, from people that were observing it and even writing about it from the outside. And uh, yeah, let's get into a little bit though about why are we covering this? We are covering a podcast, which is strange, as a podcast. Why would this be worth our time though? Well, I think one of the things that's come out of the first five episodes is um, uh, uh, several things. Uh, w- one is we're going to have to tackle Christianity Today's uh, slant in their own perspective of how they're developing the story, right? And wanting to just kind of assess what is behind maybe some of the ways they're looking at it and see if we can break that down a little bit biblically, as well as this is a primary, and it is a primary opportunity to evaluate a situation that happened in a church that for all intents and purposes, no doubt there were problems there and disqualifying problems there, but there was also a lot of fruit there. And so it confused a ton of people. It sent a bunch of people spiraling. And we're looking at it from the perspective of the church in 2021. What are some things, lessons that we we need to learn and grow from this? And where are some areas where maybe the way it's being portrayed through the podcast, we would also learn just to be better thinkers when we see someone's framing of a particular issue. And maybe the way they're framing it is not exactly the problem, so to speak, as what it maybe really is. And and we'll give you some... We'll give some context as yeah. we go forward. There, and maybe a way of saying it is, um, you know, beware, listener, that podcasts such as this are not merely biographies. There is a particular message uh, being given or a slant. You think about who's being interviewed, who was on the outside, who's not being focused on attention-wise, maybe how you're evaluating it in certain ways. And, you know, when something is such high quality, it can sometimes lead to less critical thinking and peer absorption, and we want to make sure we can hopefully help listeners think through some things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Shall we? Yeah, let's do it, man. Okay, so uh, a couple things going on. Uh, Christianity Today gives the purpose for their podcast in episode one. Basically by saying this, quote, by sharing the accounts of people who have been abused by the church, it helps others identify these patterns of abuse earlier or stop them from happening again, end quote. Uh, Now, that all sounds well and good, but here's one of the problems and concerns that I've had about the podcast, just as people are thinking about listening and critically evaluating and all that stuff, is it seems to imply subtly that Christianity Today, their podcast is going to be what needs to be depended on or is going to is going to help the stop of sin and helping mm. others identify it. Now, I want to be clear that by a, a, a pointing it out, it may give you observational skills in being able to see something maybe before um, like it would, you know, you wouldn't have maybe been able to see it in the past now that we have this to look at. But when we're talking about that, there's just a lack in the podcast of biblical truth to lead us in an understanding of mm. how do we talk about stop sin? How does that actually take place? How do we identify that biblically? And, um, you know, I think about multiple, there's no verses ever mentioned in it. Most of the people that are interviewed are interviewed from a psychological, sociological level, and you don't really have any strong theological voices in there. And so even when they're discussing some of their particular um, issues that they believe are major problems, it's hard to identify if they are more concerned with heterodoxy than heteropraxy and vice versa. Right. And so maybe well, let's we break can... break that down for a second. Yeah. Uh, so or- orthodoxy versus heterodoxy. Yeah. Uh, orthodoxy uh, regarding the Christian faith would be um, um, historical, confessional, biblically sound doctrine. Yeah, right doctrine. Right doctrine, yeah. And heterodoxy would be other, other doxy. Different. Other, yeah. and 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 not, not just a different way of saying something, but right. we're talking about uh, false teaching, false beliefs, heterodoxy, yeah. leaving the historic Christian faith from the, which is which is found in the scriptures. I'm mm-hmm. not just talking in he, in history, but we're talking about leaving a biblical faith heterodoxy, and they they compare and contrast sometimes. So here, here's like an example of how easily it would be conflated, and you may not hear this overtly, but like um, complementarianism. Yeah. Um, just I'm gonna very briefly just say uh, the office of pastor and elder reserved because of God's design for men, and and pastors are men. Um, just as an example. 
well, you know how dangerous and how abusive and how terrible Mark Driscoll became and the church was, at least at the end, and you know, uh, this is like two people having a conversation, well, gee, your church is complementarian, Susie. Um, wouldn't that be a concern that the same thing is going on at your church as happened to Mark? And right, you're like, right. the easily conflated, wrongly conflated, like, well, complementarianism is what was what fueled Mark. And so all of it's wrong. That must be the problem. Exactly. It's a throwing out of the baby with the bathwater that was the problem. You want to ditch the bathwater, I get it. And we need to learn from some of the toxic realities about views of sexuality and that that is addressed in Christianity today, but I agree with you. It seems oftentimes that they would probably be okay with throwing away complementarianism as well. And so hopefully we can kind of break that down. I do want to give a little bit of history yeah. behind Christianity today because... It's um, been around a long time. Christianity today has been around since Billy Graham, who was the founder um, want to say 60s, uh, early 60s, and um, I would just say that from its origination, it is a far cry from what it used to be. Um, let, me, let me just this give you This is one reason why of... the, the, the sarcastic joke is Christianity today, more like Christianity yesterday. Exactly. they're saying they just left Orthodox. Speaking of Orthodoxy, right, right, right. they really You moved. used to be Christian. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a couple great guys were involved in it at the beginning. There was Harold uh, Akenga. There was obviously Billy Graham. It was really his vision that he was driving, but he brought in a solid theologian by the name of Carl F.H. Henry to be involved in the start of Christianity. Christianity Today, and here's what Carl F.H. Henry's vision was for uh, the magazine. He said, quote, the Bible says is not a mere Graham platitude being Billy Graham, nor a fundamentalist cliche. It is the note of authority in Protestant preaching lost by the meandering modernism of the past generation held fast by the evangelical movement. Now he's speaking, end quote. So, so there's something there where they were going to be mm -hmm. serious about the Bible. And, uh, and they were really breaking from and kind of establishing sort of what we understand of uh, as the modern evangelical movement, which is a commitment, at least at its foundation, for a strong view of God's word, a strong view of the uh, uh, inerrancy, authority, sufficiency of scripture. And uh, Carl F.H. Henry was certainly going to uh, be on that page, so strong with the word. Billy Graham's vision was like this, not far uh, off from where Carl F.H. Henry was. Quote, it was my vision that the magazine be pro-church and pro-denomination, and that it become the rallying point of evangelicalism within and without the large denominations. And Ian Murray then comments on that quote, at the earlier date, the mainstream denominations where liberalism was to be found had no place in his thinking. And so what you have, at least at the beginning, was a commitment to the Word of God, a pro-church movement. But sadly, what's happened over time, and it was probably uh, an effect of the ecumenical movement that Billy Graham sort of leaked into over time, is that the magazine has slowly had a reputation for becoming a theologically liberal publication, and that probably leads us into, you know, some of the people involved in the podcast. Right. So in the most recent episode uh, regarding the kind of the theme of how women were treated, you've got, this is a, just an example, um, the author, and her name is escaping me right now, but I believe this came, book came out last year, uh, Jesus and John Wayne. Uh, early in the podcast, uh, she comes up, and she comes up several times just from a sociological perspective about conservative, you know, m male leadership in the church. Again, complementarianism and her uh, tying her own perspective and history on things. And she's just sort of put out there like, uh, you know, her, her word, her opinion settles the matter. She right. just sort of uh, acts as an authority. And I'm not saying that she doesn't have any insight to give, because there is good insight to, to be had from people people of many diverse places and opinions, and yet you don't have um, anyone hemming this perspective in at all on mm -hmm. the podcast. It's just, boom, she drops a 30 to 60 second thing, and, and it's just picked up as the authority of like why Driscoll was how he was, and mm -hmm. what influenced him, and the whole thing is now wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah, her name is Kristen Demez, and uh, sh she's kind of propped up. Rachel Held Evans is propped up, who is definitely... Uh 
you know, heterodox in her uh, theology. Tony Jones was an emergent guy who basically went left when Driscoll went right, and he's kind of brought in. And it's like, look at these guys. They're so much nicer, you know? Right. And so that's kind of some of the issue. There's definitely in Christianity sort of this uh, predominant doctrine of niceness where that sort of trumps everything else. Like, you could have the the right thing, but if you're not nice, then it, it's not right, and it should yeah. be ignored. And, and so um, there's no doubt that... That, that tone definitely does ma- matter, but to neglect the truth because of the tone mm. it, it is oftentimes a foolish decision. You have Mike Cosper, who's the narrator of the podcast, who himself is egalitarian. So when you were mentioning complementarian, you have the other position, which is egalitarian, which is essentially equality of man and woman across the board. Anything a man can do, a woman can do. So a woman can be a preacher and a pastor, pastor preacher. right? Yep. And he's there as well. So you come in with your own views and of course, we, you and I have our own views, and we all have our own views, and that's not an issue. We're just talking about when you address something like, you know, um, hierarchy of roles and responsibilities, and, and that was the downfall. Mm. No, I think it was the abuse of that in the church, and not necessarily that there was hierarchy or, or a word that's often used, patriarchy, right? I mean, right, we right, see right. in a place like 2 Corinthians 11.3 that there clearly is hierarchy, Oh, you mean the Bible says that? The Bible. Oh, that's what we're here to do. Fascinating. Help think Let's go with there, their Scott. Bibles. And um, yes, this is such a helpful verse, and we've actually, um, man, spent some time here, preached through this book recently. Um, so you're in First Corinthians. I'm sorry. Yes, First Corinthians okay. eleven three. I often say the wrong book, and then lead people to find that quote. In the Bible, it's somewhere. A, it's a journey. Type it it's a Google, journey over man. here, Type folks. Type it into Google. <laughs> All right, verse three, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So there is definite distinction going on here. I mean, we can certainly get into the realities of going through like Ephesians 5, for example, and, you know, being filled by the Spirit and uh, addressing one another in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, submitting to one another. And then here's those those areas to submit to, uh, husbands and wi- wives to husbands and children to parents and slaves to masters and on and on we can go. So God's established that. That in and of itself is not a wrong thing, right. nor do we want to make it seem that way in the midst of it. And so that's kind of some of our concern, at least in the way it's portrayed in the podcast. Because the portrayal is this pure investigative journalism and, and right. not some of the subtle things that are, I, I would argue after the first couple episodes, it was just, man, I'm all in. God, this is so interesting. Right. And now that we're five episodes in, it's getting a lot more clear yeah. what the angle is of maybe answering that original question, you know, who can Mars Hill? Um, and we should even mention this too, you know, um, um, like the the John MacArthur angle that was largely yeah. uh, left behind. MacArthur um, is uh, should be getting more probably you know, credit for ten to fifteen years ago, calling out like guys. Mark Driscoll is um, he's, he's dangerous, you know. He's theologically reformed, but in his character, in his sexualization of his sermon, Song of Solomon, uh, for example, it's not that you don't preach through Song of Solomon, but it's the way he did that, the things he talked about, the again sexual nature, and it wasn't just, you didn't have to be in a text to get Mark to still talk about, it didn't, it didn't matter what text was sometimes, he'd, he'd go there, and Driscoll, um, um, MacArthur sounded the alarm regularly, took up a stance against that this 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 guy basically mm-hmm. and what was going on and people dismissed him or waffled you know because he was becoming so influential selling so many books he was on the um, reformed uh, conference circuit but but MacArthur over here is just basically the lone voice in the wind back in the day uh, and probably doesn't get as much credit as he should for calling that out and not unusual for MacArthur he's been there multiple times where he's kind of called something and then basically dismissed for his tone again like that doctrine of nice. He didn't say it in a nice way, so he's basically been dismissed, but so often he's calling these things and he's hitting them on the head. And so you're right about that. You're right about MacArthur's perspective. Now, what's interesting is that was mentioned by a few on social media, and it's been very interesting to watch those who are uh, producing in a part of the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast responding back to guys like Phil Johnson, the executive director of Grace to You, Hmm. under John MacArthur, of saying that MacArthur's critiques and Phil Johnson's critiques are actually part of the problem for why, um, 
it didn't work to 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 um for for Driscoll to be addressing those things or to to have those addressed because all they were doing was stirring up a firestorm mm, when we were trying right. to address things personally and and behind closed doors and these kind of things so they're actually blaming John MacArthur in some ways even now wow. for the problems that his critique caused and uh, and that's the that's the place we're living in now where where the truth even when it's presented so clearly and he 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 was a four post blog series I think MacArthur did on the rape of Solomon's song yeah, yeah. that you're you're referring to there so anyway very interesting to see that even still he's being blamed rather than it, it being acknowledged that he was actually one of those voices so yeah, very interesting yeah. well as we as we think about kind of analyzing the podcast here the idea came up as we were getting ready for this today just man how can we help people um, avoid overreacting or overcorrecting we talked about hey it wasn't that the theological paradigm was necessarily wrong but the character was not there the maturity the development the right people around this person i.e. Mark Driscoll wasn't there how do we avoid overreacting or overcorrecting when we do see leaders fall because um, Driscoll <laughs> wasn't the first and hasn't been the last, and um, it's still going on, and we could bring present-day examples in. Uh, but nonetheless, let's get into a few things so we just can help people say, um, I really want to—I need to evaluate this well. All right, let, let's, let me frame it like this. Let me give a few kind of caveats before we start this list, because I just want to acknowledge these are some things true of my heart. Like, yeah. as my, I, I'm enjoying this podcast, for the record. Like, I'm really enjoying it. I feel like um, th there's so much history in it, um, yeah. so many things I can relate to. You and I were talking about many of the messages that are being quoted, we, we can actually remember mm -hmm. uh, having listened to at some point. So, so let me say this. Uh, first of all, from a biblical perspective, let's acknowledge some things about our flesh. All of us with the flesh, the flesh, first of all, loves gossip. So what I'm saying is we can listen to this and just be glad we know about the dirty laundry that th that's now being aired publicly mm. for everyone to see. Yeah. And that's a concern because gossip is sinful, right? And, and it's mentioned multiple times. I'll give you 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It truly is 2 Corinthians this time. Verse 20, Paul's saying, for I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder, not good areas, not good categories, those sinful categories, right? Yep. So the flesh loves gossip. Another thing, the flesh loves being know-it-alls after the fact, right? It's so easy to look back on everything and go, oh, duh, we've got it all figured out now. Yep. Now we see from the vantage point that we should, and here's the reality. We are still blind to our sin. We still need community and people around us to speak truth into our lives. We still need to be asking the Lord to reveal areas in our heart and our life that we need to address ourselves and to leave this from a kind of prideful um like, oh, uh, like roll our eyes. It's kind of like what we do with Israel in the Old Testament, right? All oh, those dummies. Yeah, right. You're like, right. um, yeah, y y like you, like you. So let's just be mindful of, let's not be know-it-alls. That's not the goal. And I'll just say one more. The flesh loves to critique while not doing anything themselves. And here's what I mean by that. Right. Yeah. D.L. Moody has this quote that I love. When he was critiqued about his evangelism style, he said, I like the way I evangelize better than the way that you don't. Ooh. Okay? So there's well, that, something that mic to drop. that. If yeah. that was around back then, that's a mic <laughs> drop. imagine that in the DL. back after a like, huge uh, revival or whatever <laughs> he was doing at the time, you know, preaching at a church, and he's like, that he just, that, that, that has stuck with me for so long, and the Lord was doing some pretty amazing work. He was bold enough to start a church. Now, are there other things involved with motivation? Sure, but he was, there were some things he took a step of faith in, and so we, we want to... We, won't, we don't want to be critiquers in our pajamas, you know, where we can just look on and be like, oh, that's so dumb. But never actually, have you ever taken a risk to, to honor Christ in, in some way? And, and you know, you just never been in it. So you'd never even been in a situation right. to blow it like this, right? I mean, I think it's just a humility that we need in the midst of this. But all that being said, there are uh, right ways to learn from uh, the lessons of Mars Hill, and and you, we have several yeah. for you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one for example, I've 
I've I've been I've been driving, I've been exercising, I've been making coffee, listening to this in all different environments, and it has hit me so many times in all those spaces. Just oh my goodness, Lord, help me um, drill into what I need to take from this for my own personal growth and self evaluation. May I not be uh, the that guy with that orthodoxy, but that heteropraxy, yeah, right? The the practice good. of the Christian faith, the practice of faithful pastoral ministry that ends up boastful and prideful and selfish, but then in front of a large group is just preaching the Bible, and so is getting that right in one sense. And I know we could and and you know tear apart certain parts of what Jerusco did, but in our memories, formative, his preaching, that's all we really were around. So much of it was to be appreciated, though his strong preaching style to men. Like, I still think of some of the ways I, I tr try to do that at times, and I'm thankful for that example, although we could say boundaries could have been crossed by Driscoll, right? So so we don't want to um, just say, oh, geez, you know, Driscoll just didn't get anything right. No, he, he, he had right theology in a lot of ways, but Lord, help me to be, like 1 Timothy 3 says, help me to be the kind of man who was qualified to have this uh, office of pastor, elder, overseer, mm -hmm. if you would have me to continue in it, right? And we're not going to, uh, well, we, we can read a few of these verses because this is going to be very important. Um, um, and First Peter, I think it's five, would also be. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, but a lover of money, uh, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he not? How will he care for God's church? And it goes on from there. Um, and you know that Driscoll preached through that stuff. Yeah. And then you come to find out that he was not self-controlled, particularly around his anger and around his aggression. And so, Lord, give me a, an evaluation, even as I listen to this very sad tale of how I, um, in my own flesh, can can go every direction that Driscoll ended up going. Man, that's good. Yep. I need that from my own heart. Appreciate that. Agree with that. I think there's so many personal growth opportunities. Even if you're not a pastor, there's a lot of personal growth opportunities, self-evaluation. I think there were some good lessons in the podcast. I want to share right. a couple of them. I think there, there, are, there have been some good ones. So in episode one, I think kind of the crowning lesson of episode one is the concern of giftedness raising people to influence levels and platforms their godliness can't hold up under. Okay, so when giftedness right. is greater than godliness, you have a serious problem on your hands, and it is hard to correct or uh, mature that godliness at a speed fast enough when you have a rising star, hmm. and he was yeah. absolutely gifted, and so there's no doubt that is a legitimate lesson brought out from the podcast that I appreciate, that I tremble at, um, that I find your list you just shared to be kind of interesting because you read First Timothy 3, and I'll be it a little bit quickly, but here's what we found in that. Only one of those aspects is about gifting. Mm. Just one. Teaching. Yeah. yeah. Everything else is about godliness, is about character. See, that's, that's humbling, and that's a serious... Um, we should tremble at that. And, and as pastors, especially young guys, we should be focused on our godliness. It's not to say you don't want to grow in your giftedness, but it is to say that it's sometimes a grace of God if you don't excel at your platform well beyond where your godliness is that time. It's usually a grace of the Lord. Another one that came up in episode two was uh, the influence of the seeker movement and Robert Schuller. What did you think about that? That the, was interesting. It was very revelatory, yeah. you know, the compare and contrast and the ways in which he seemed, it, being Driscoll, so utterly different from maybe Rick Warren, so utterly different from other, you know, uh, uh, Chicago. Um, Bill Hybels. Thank you, Bill yeah. Hybels. Seemed his personality and his his uh, his style, but then you dig just a little bit beneath it, and, and there was a, a um, over over time, I would say, probably not at the beginning, but over time, a buying into of, of a lot of the same philosophy building around the self, the person, the preacher, uh, you know, your 
entire job is to bring them basically to me on Sunday morning mm-hmm. so I can preach, so I can get them. And it was a self-focus of a single man. It was it was incredible. Um, honestly, those two first episodes were, were the ones so far I've appreciated the most. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, part of what was um, addressed, I think it was in that same podcast, uh, Driscoll's whole speech to his staff, I am the brand. Right. I yeah, am the brand. I, I am the brand. And that's been pretty popular. People have used that in evangelicalism. But I, I think what I found fascinating is that the seeker movement kind of snuck into a more solid theological um, grid or through a more solid theological grid. In other words, um, I expect uh, that kind of stuff in the kind of more mainstream um, seeker friendly churches, sure. but this was a repackaging of pragmatism in a new garb, a more solid garb. And I think there's the importance of being able to distinguish between good theology. So we're talking about orthodoxy, pra- uh, belief, right? Belief and orthopraxy, right? Practice, yeah. but also separating right theology from worldly ide- ideologies, you know? And, and one of those is pragmatism, which essentially just to give a definition for that is to say, uh, if it works, then it's good or it, right. It produced church growth. Yep. So it was good. Let's do it. Yeah. And yeah. oftentimes people see that as God's blessing. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they've done, a um, I thought, an interesting and admirable job just helping me understand the, um, the fruit on the outside and yet the rottenness of the um, domineering and authoritarian and heavy-handed leadership style, the de- demonization of other leaders, right? You think about certain elders that got kicked out, or you think of a certain staff that got, you know, with without maybe mourning and without, uh, uh, you know, any any kind of run-up, they just were eliminated. Yeah. And so we're over here as, as young, mid-20-somethings, appreciating so much what we're hearing, and then as you get to know the inside of it, as the podcast has helped us, it's helped us see some of these names. I knew some of their names right, of former leaders, pastors, just how uh, toxic mm-hmm. it, it was, and how again the the, the 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 takeaway as a pastor. But you don't have to be a pastor. You could yeah, be a no. father and think of your own home, a mother sure. think of your own home, a small group leader think of the culture, business the, leader business leader think of the culture you are influencing and leading. But the the church would be a a definitely Im- important focus. But to say it doesn't have to only be that. Sure, sure. Am I of a am I of a character that is um, consistent? If I if there's fruit being born, if God's blessing, what's going on in terms of maybe numerical growth and those sort of things, am I, is the character matching that? Is is the gifting and the character hopefully growing together and complementing each other, uh, or or is one so outpaced, the gifting, and everybody kind of for a long time thought things were so amazing up there in Seattle, and yet the train wreck that it was on the inside. Yep. In episode four, I thought the, uh, the... Argument. You, you you think about it again. We don't want to be know it alls looking back and going, why why didn't they see that right? And there's a reason people stayed at the church even when right. they saw concerns. Why did they? Why why did that happen? Right? And they bring up the point in episode four that the argument was, but dot dot dot. Look at the fruit. There was so much fruit in that ministry, and that is an excuse for many, many people why they stay at the ministry. Just look at the fruit, Mm -hmm. and it provides a covering for, an excuse for harsh, domineering behavior, questionable things behind closed doors, questionable practices and quick firings of staff, you name it. There could be a bunch of internal issues, but look at the fruit. It's the whole thing you were talking about with those guys with the ministry, kind of self-centered, bring them to me sort of ministry. Um, It's all about the mission to the extent that a lot of other things can fly because of it. And I think that's how that stuff gets tolerated. That was a helpful, helpful lesson as well. The fruit is important, but to say it is solely important. Mm. The mission is important, but it's honestly an ox. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, they're not mutually exclusive. You, you, it's like, oh, the fruit matters. The fruit matters. Well, how you get that fruit matters. The yeah. mission matters. The mission the matters. Means don't justify the ends. Right. Yeah. But yeah. but but in order to accomplish the mission genuinely, you need to be growing in your own godliness. You need to be growing in the things that aren't okay that are going on be- behind the scenes. Right. right. But anyway, though, there's been some good lessons within the podcast itself. Yeah, no doubt. You know, thinking about um, just the you mentioned early on, just the nature of uh, Mark's 
I'm going to say kind of self-proclaimed and assumed authority with the God told me so. Yes. Um, you know, he said, I don't know how many times, truly could not count anymore, how many times I know, um, probably maybe going to, you can get there with me, but he said, God told me to do three things, right? Right. Uh, love my wife, plant, plant a church, church preach, preach the, the word, word, train men. Four. Train men, yeah. four things. Yeah. yeah. Love my wife, plant the church, preach the word, train men. Yep. Um, God told me, God told me. And that and that was like, hey, that's, that's amazing. You were 19 or you were 21 and you knew that's what God told you to do. And and there was a lot of, I guess, in a sense, respect for that clarity of the call that God had given on your life. Uh, and and yet that same um concept was used as justification to leave, to the, leave church. the church. Uh, God t- I, I, God came to me in a vision. God, Grace, his wife, was in another room, and and he there's a recording of him describing this, right? right. Like I, I you know, I believe God spoke to me, I believe God spoke to me, and they they confirmed each other's intuitions. And I'm not I, I can't be the one to say, well that can't ever happen. But I can say that in the context of a church genuinely seeking to repair the damage and keep him keep him there by all accounts. People that are... Restore him, even. Rest, that's the point. They yeah. wanted to restore him, keep him there, keep this going, restore godliness where there was ungodliness, but not blow the whole thing up. Well, God told me I was released, so see you later, see right? You later, Peace right. out. Uh, and, and then and then you've got... He, he tried to forgive people for things they never knew they were going to do. He was like minority report pastor. You know, like, I, I knew the sin you were about to commit to, you know, stab me in the back. And and I can't remember the pastor's name who was accused of that. You know, mm-hmm. it was over coffee many months yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, I was not going to do that. Yes, you were. How do you know? God told me. God, so the vision thing yep. is dangerous in, in that regard. Yeah, I have a whole ton of problems with the God told me language. I do. I do. I, I yeah. So at 19, you said it. God told him, gave him those four realities. He he would talk about it as if God spoke to him audibly, is mm. what he would say. Right. Okay. And again, wasn't there? Um, but it is it is what he says. And then in 2014, we don't get as much from him the words God spoke to us audibly as much as you said it was an intuition. But here's my problem that I have with it. God told him to, first of all, and, and those things at the beginning at 19 were like lifelong things, right? So now right. in the middle of his life, he was only in his late 40s when all this went down. And it I went, don't even think he was that old. It's only 50-something now. Yeah, so seven okay, years yeah, ago. Early, okay, yeah, okay. So let's just, 40. somewhere in his sure, 40s, sure, yeah. right? Seems so old to us in right, our right, 30s. Right, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, wow, this guy. Um, that, 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 we're talking about the middle of his life, right? We're talking about, that's crazy to think now. God's like, you know what? Uh, all that stuff, I, I didn't really, you know, mean that trap this that church was set. kind of thing. Yeah. Well, oh yeah, and then there's that. So God told him he was released. That's how he got out of Marsil at the end, which I think is interesting considering he was, anyway, it seemed like his, God told him initially that was his job for the rest of his life. And that he added that a trap had been set for him and that God had told him that only to have it, seems like pretty clearly explained by those in uh, positions of authority as elders that that was not the heart right. that they had at all. Here's my biggest problem with all of it, though. The God told me line becomes a subversion to Scripture. It becomes, it's subversive right. to the process of biblical restoration. It's subversive to the process that God has established in the local church to take care of these kind of issues. I think of multiple verses that come uh, to mind in this, but I'll give you 1 Timothy 5.20. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that they may stand in fear, right? Matthew 15, uh, 18, 15 and following it talks about the rest restoration process and seeing that brother come to repentance. And what it basically does is when you say, if God, you know, God spoke to me, then my question is, when does the Bible ever win? And it's Who a, needs the Bible at that point? It's a self-certifying claim right. that you can't Trump card. You, you can't refute, you yeah. can't prove, you can't refute, and the person's confidence is going to win. Right. And, and that, in that moment, what God told me to, I'm released, however we're going to say it, and there's no evaluation of it. Usually there wasn't in this case, and he defends that to this day. So just the, yes, the... Um, 
just the, the dangerous nature of God told me so that trumps what apparently God had told him to do previously. Now, he probably would say, no, 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 none of that changed. Where was going to happen changed? Which I would say, well, it's awfully convenient when things got pretty hot that you bounced. You right. know, they got they got hard and, and all of this. And it, it, it sure appears from all the different testimonies, the goal was restoration. The goal was ongoing you know, partnership and ministry up in Seattle, and 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 yet never came to be. I just want to have a last word to say. If we want to say God told me, let's just then quote the Bible, just generally speaking, right? Yep. And and if you want to say, I feel like God is leading me in a particular reason because of X, Y, or Z, that's a little bit yep. different, right? Yep. God told me, that's pretty strong, and I hope afterwards we're quoting Scripture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea of a subjective leading of the yeah, Holy Spirit sure. is not what we're talking no. about. It's the clarity and the authoritarian, authoritarian way in which he just went about the it, which Trump is what many version. people do. Right. So in conclusion, should people uh, who have, maybe they don't know about this podcast yet, should they go catch up with the Mars Hill podcast, Scott? Tell me. Well, I think, first of all, we're assuming many are. Uh, which is why we're doing the podcast right. in the beginning. But if you haven't been, uh, we, we do think it's helpful to listen to. We yeah. do think it's insightful in some ways, but we wanted to make sure, as this podcast is directed towards helping people think with their Bibles, that we just sort of help you be mindful of the fact that anytime you're listening to a particular take on something, it's going to come with its own kind of viewpoints. And so hopefully we've addressed some of those, and um, you can be mindful of that as you listen. But yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a fascinating, well done done podcast. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. And hope this is helpful for those of you who have already been listening, or if you get started, have these things in mind, you'll probably at different points in the podcast be able to kind of hear what we're talking about and say, ah, okay, that's not without a perspective. This is not, there is no neutrality. There is no um, ability to have not have a bias. And, and let's be aware of those things. Let's appreciate it for what it is. There's a whole lot of good in it. There's a reason it's so popular and not because of the quality alone, which is great, but there's a lot to take from this. And so let's learn together. Let's grow in the Lord for faithful ministry and let's continue to pursue his glory together. Yeah. You've been listening to Doxologic, a podcast by Doxa Church in Rockland, California. To learn more, visit doxachurch.net.